I need a thunder response from you, and, and that is, he's risen. He's risen he has. There was thunder here at Harbor Church Auditorium. I hope there was thunder back at home, because that's true, and that's the only reason why it's well with our souls. So I get to talk about that this morning, that the Lord Jesus is risen. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, the passage that Aaron read, and I'll just read a brief portion Remember verse 5, it says that the angel answered and said to the women, Don't be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he was lying. And then just let me pick up in verse 19, where Jesus on the mount says, All authority has been given to me in heaven. This is just before he ascended. He said, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you for the blessing of this morning. And though we're not where we want to be, we want to be with the the church, the, the multitude of souls who are celebrating this glorious victory over death. Uh, though we can't be physically together, we know that we can be together in spirit. And we trust that you are here with us. So come with your Holy Spirit and help us and glorify yourself and do good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, back in the late 1500s, a man named William Perkins graduated from Cambridge College. He was ordained to be a minister, and he began preaching to prisoners in the Cambridge jail. Now, he received no salary at all for his labors, and, and later he was appointed actually as preacher at St. Andrew's Church there, but he never forgot the preciousness of a single prisoner's Soul, And it was told that one day while Perkins was strolling through a public square, he saw a gallows on which stood a, a, a hanging was about to happen. And there was a man who'd been convicted of murder. And as Perkins observed from a distance, he, he saw the condemned and bound young man slowly and heavily climbing the stairs of those gallows. And Perkins shouted to the youth, Sir! Sir! Why do you climb those stairs so slowly? You look afraid. And the young men volleyed back to him. I, I fear not the rope of these gallows, but I fear the dreadful judgment that's beyond, that awaits me. And so you think of us, even now, it's, it's 2020, and as we stroll the, the COVID-19 streets of Holland or... The, the Renaissance Center of Detroit or Times Square of New York, we're really these days kind of viewing basically the same sight that William Perkins saw centuries ago. We see mask-wearing people. We see afraid people slowly climbing the gallows, soon to die and face the dreadful judgment and punishment that's beyond for sinners. That's all of us. All of us are really climbing these gallows. And certain death, it, it's only really moments away for us. Maybe days, it may be years. And the question is, is there anything timely that we can say to the heavy-laden sinners of our day who are about to swing who are about to be strangled by that black enemy of death. In fact, I saw that in Michigan, we're over 1,300 people now <clears throat> who have died from COVID-19. Do we have anything to say to our fellow Michiganders and countrymen? Well, the answer is yes, we do. We have a, a lot to say because we have a remedy to the universal death problem that's facing our fellow man. And that remedy is epitomized, really, in the theme of this Resurrection Day. And that is that he's risen. He's risen indeed. And that's what I want to look at here, this 
resurrection narrative of Christ that's present in Matthew chapter 28. And I want to unpack it, the whole, the whole chapter. And we'll do it in four major headings, seeing four major themes. Come on with me to the first, and that is the certainty of Christ's resurrection. He has risen. Indeed, he has. It's certain. If we looked at Matthew 27, there's the, the setting to Matthew 28. We see Jesus' execution by crucifixion. We see him being brought to this horrifying and certain death. Just, just to recount, Lord Jesus Christ had been beaten and scourged, and he carried that cross beam up Golgotha, and the spikes were driven through his hands and his feet, and there he hung naked between heaven and earth for hours, strangling and suffocating in agony. And it said then, in 2750, it said then, he cried out with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. And John 19 says that the last words of the Lord Jesus were, it is finished, and he bowed his head. And then Mark 15 said, he breathed his last. So he was dead. It's a certainty. He was dead. In fact, look, the centurion there in 2754 said what? Surely this man was the son of God. And in John 20, it says that the soldiers later on, they were seeking to clean up their stage of gallows, which was Golgotha. And so they, they broke the legs of the lingering criminals. That would be death by shock. But when they came to Jesus, they found it says he was already dead. And so they took a spear and pierced his side and out poured blood and water, as this was the sure death certificate. He was dead. Dead. So, so dead that in Mark 15 it said, Joseph mustered up enough courage to go to Pilate. And it says there, Pilate wondered, is he, is he really dead? <clears throat> so Pilate summoned the centurion, and the centurion gave witness, he's dead, certifying he was dead indeed. And so down from the cross, they took this corpse of this dead Jesus, and they handled him. He was, he was dead. They, they wrapped him up, and they perfumed him, and the tomb was sealed on this dead body, and it was guarded. It was guarded all Friday night, guarded all Saturday. Now, late Saturday night, the women went off, we're told in Mark 16, 1, and they prepared spices and ointments. Because they were going to anoint the dead body. Because it was dead. But before the sun rose on that first day, divine power was exerted on that stone dead body. An old London preacher Spurgeon, he put it this way. That silent heart began to beat again. And through the stagnant canals of the veins... The life blood began to circulate, and the soul of the Redeemer again took possession of the body. It, it lived once more. And we see that he who was certainly dead, <laughs> now he was certainly alive, and he, he rose from the dead. How do we know that? Well, we're told that there was a, a flashing of a white angel who was sent down from heaven. Not to raise Jesus up from the dead. No, no, just, just to roll back the stone to showcase and to display to all of history what had taken place inside that tomb. That he had triumphed over death as a conquered enemy. As it says, look, in 28.6, the angel said, he's not here. He's risen. Just as he said, come on, come on and see the place, the passage says. And then it's glorious. The Lord Jesus actually made a personal appearance. Look what it says in 9 and 10. And behold, Jesus met them, the woman, 
and, and he greeted those women. And they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. You see, this isn't just hearsay of, of an angel saying that he was risen. Not just the evidence of the empty tomb, but it's the personal witness of these women. Doesn't it say that a testimony is to be believed only at the testimony of two or three? That's who we have here, these women who they actually clasped, they touched his feet. He wasn't a phantom. We find later on Thomas in John chapter 20. Thomas had, I won't believe unless I touch his hands, wounded. Put my hand in his side. In Luke 24, he, he ate a fish. A phantom doesn't eat fish, but Jesus did because he was dead. And now he was alive. And I know that there's a, there's a lame tale told by the Sanhedrin described in Matthew 28 that, that Christ's followers, those cowards who were tucked away in an upper room, that they had the boldness to come out and steal a body. Oh, they were paid a price to tell that tale. And later on it says in the back end of Matthew 28, verse 15 and following, that the 11 saw them on the mountain. In fact, 1, John, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says 500 saw him at one time. See, the point I'm making here is the certainty of Christ's resurrection. He was certainly dead. And now he's certainly risen. He's risen indeed. But consider secondly now, having seen the certainty of Christ's resurrection, consider the significance of Christ's resurrection. You may say, oh, Pastor Mark, that sounds, that sounds really exciting. But frankly, theologically and philosophically, I, I just can't pin down the significance of his rising from the dead. It sounds really joyful, but so what? what? What's the big deal? I used to think about that too in my younger Christian life. Let me just give you four significances of Christ's resurrection from the dead. The first is, it's a verification of another life. Think about that. His resurrection is a verification of another life. Do you ever, like me, doubt the existence of a world to come? You ever wonder? You ever been at a funeral and someone's being put down into the dirt, into the ground, and wonder, is there anything beyond the grave, or is that just wishful thinking on my part? Have I just inhaled the opia of the masses? You ever wonder that like I do? Well, Jesus, we see, as some would describe death, Poetically, what, what, what is death? A definition I've read recently, it's death is that undiscovered country from whose boundaries no traveler ever returns. Interesting definition. But it's a false one. It's false because Christ traveled it. And Christ did return to tell us what's there. In fact, Jesus said, told his disciples in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house, it's, that's this, this country beyond death. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. I go there to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. And I'm going to return back for you, Jesus had promised. But look what we have here in this account of the resurrection in Matthew 28. Lord Jesus Christ went to that undiscovered country and he returned. He came back to this world and he verified that there is a land beyond and a glorious one. And when he came, like it says in Matthew 28, 6, he came just as he said. He arrived right on time on the third day like he promised. And so this dispels all doubts. Uh, there is a paradise. Didn't he say to the thief on the cross, you'll be with me this day, that land beyond? He called it paradise in another world. That's a real place. There is a destination of eternal bliss beyond for the children of God. How do we know that? 
Because Jesus died. And he went there. And he returned because he rose. And you know what? He returned that day. And he's going to return for us one day, just as he promised. Because our Savior always keeps every one of his promises. They're all yea and amen. So, so, so just like Columbus returned to Spain and confirmed that there is a new world, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrection returned from another world back to us to validate it's true. So the significance of Christ's resurrection, it's verification of another world. But a second significance is it's authentication of Jesus' teaching. Deuteronomy 18 in the Old Testament spoke about if a prophet comes to you and he gives you a prophecy, says believe him as long as what he prophesies really takes place. But it says if he makes a prophecy but the prophecy doesn't take place, disregard that prophet because he's a liar, he's a fraud, it says. Well, the Lord Jesus came and he spoke as a prophet from God. And he, he staked his whole ministry on one particular prophecy, one particular sign. The Pharisees says, give us a sign. And what did Jesus say? Well, the sign shall be the sign of Jonah, who was three days in the belly of the whale, and he came out. So the Son of Man will be three days in the belly of the earth, and he will come out. In fact, it says in Mark 8 and Mark 10, the Son of Man shall be killed, and three days later he shall rise again. Jesus staked all of his credibility on his fulfilling that sign of dying and rising from the dead. He staked everything, his whole ministry, on it. A stake can be an important thing. Years ago, our son Jared and I went to Texas Stadium. Really, now it's called AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. You ever been there? It's got, you've seen not on television. There's this big jumbotron TV screen that hangs from the ceiling of AT&T Stadium. And it's grand, and it's sophisticated, it's, it's two-sided. It's 160 feet long, and it's 70. You think you've got a big one in your living room. This one's 160 feet long, and it's 72 feet high, and listen, it has 30 million pixelated light bulbs. That's a big one. Now imagine that screen just hanging by one rope onto a pulley on the ceiling of AT&T Stadium, and the rope then comes down to the end zone, and it's staked into the ground in the end zone, all being held by that one stake. That's kind of like the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his grand and sophisticated and elaborate teaching and doctrine. Jesus taught many pixelated lights of truth. Uh, he was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. He taught that. He prophesied that the Son of Man could forgive sins, that, that you'd see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. He said the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give himself as a ransom for many. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He said, I am the bread of life. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Eat and drink, and you won't die. He said, I'll send a comforter. And he said, I and the Father are one. He said, I am God. Look at all that doctrine, that, that grand, sophisticated doctrine Jesus taught. But you realize, it's true only if he rises from the dead because he staked everything on his coming out of the tomb alive. He doesn't come out of the tomb alive. The whole grand doctrine of Jesus' teaching crashes to the field below and is useless and it's foolish for us to believe. But the reality is, like it says in Romans 1.4, Jesus declared... Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power. You know what the phrase then is? By the resurrection from the dead. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of 
the dead. In other words, Jesus' authority holds firm. The stake is unbudgeable. Jesus spoke infallible truth. Everything he said is yea and amen. Every syllable. Believe him in everything he said. Because he fulfilled his prophecy. So, the authentication of Jesus' teaching is at stake here. But thirdly, by way of the significance of Christ's resurrection, it's confirmation of Jesus' work. Jesus, he was a Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. On his shoulders, he did carry the weight of the sin of his people. Isaiah 53 says, The Lord caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He bore our sin. And so Jesus, he went into the, didn't go on a gallows, but we could say he went into a courtyard. And the firing squad of God's justice emptied all of its guns onto him until the last penny was paid to justice. Like it says in Matthew 5, 26, he shall not come out until he has paid the last penny. That's the sinner before the judge. And we see that with the resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ comes out of that courtyard. He's released by the firing squad. Justice smiles and asks no more. Why? Because he paid the debt of our sin to the last bullet, the last hit, the last cent. Paid it in full. And in his death, Jesus said, it is finished. And in his resurrection, the Father says, I am satisfied. He's released. All of our debt, every debt that we ever had, the song says, has been paid up in full by the Lamb of the Lord. Be ye glad, be ye glad, be ye glad. Resurrection is so crucial. But the fourth significance is, it's also the certification of Christian rising. We're all going to die unless Christ comes home first. That that pale horse of Revelation chapter 6 has been galloping cross-country in America. It's been galloping through mission. In fact, the actual figure this morning was 1,392 Michiganders had died of COVID-19. And so many funerals in Michigan. And we've had funerals in our church. I wonder, it's, has it been a fool's errand for us to bury like Dave Bulthouse and Glenn Rillema and Andy Butts and even my dad, Dick Chansky, in the ground in these cemeteries? And we always put their feet in what direction? We always make sure their feet are headed to the east. Because why? Because it says in Matthew 24, the Son of Man shall come like the lightning flashes from the, from the east the West. So you want to make sure that Dave and Glenn and Andy and Dick, when Jesus comes back, they can just sit up. They don't have to crane their necks to see him coming because he is coming back because they will. They will rise again from the dead. It's a certainty. We don't grieve as those who have no hope, it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, but we believe He left, Jesus did, and he's coming back. And those of us who die, we're going to rise at the voice of the archangel, at the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Will. It's certain. Because Christ has defeated the grave. And therefore, there's going to be this grand reunion in heaven. Oh, it's so significant that Jesus rose from the dead. Those four lines. But come on with me thirdly. Thirdly. Just consider with me the reward of Christ's resurrection. We've seen the certainty of it, the significance of it. Now consider the reward of Christ's resurrection. In 28, 18, it says, Jesus on the mount, speaking to the many, up in Galilee, he says, all authority, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. That word authority is the Greek word exousia, which means all all power, all ability. Hendrick says, was given to him as a reward for accomplishing his father's work. 
Because in Christ's humiliation, he laid aside the exercise of his omnipotent power. But now having raised in his exaltation, the Father restores to the Son his omnipotent power. Look what it says in Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 19, about this power and authority. What is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him up at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Look, 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 look. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him head over all these things. Now, look at this phrase, to the church or for the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Look at that, all power in heaven. Now it emanates from Christ who sits on God's throne it, and the Father gives it to the Son and the Son holds that power in himself, all power. What's he going to do with all that power that he has now that he's risen and ascended? He could do a lot of things. He could maybe... Just with one word, he could create another universe. If he wanted to, he could. He could just speak a word, and through the Hubble telescope, scientists would, would see maybe a new cluster of galaxies forming, and we'd blink into that. What? What is going on here? He, he could do that with the power that he now has. Or he could just say to Mount Everest, be gone, and be leveled. Whoa! Or he could say to the Grand Canyon, be filled, and it'd be flat. He could do all those things, and all those things would amaze us. But all those things are really child's play in comparison to what he has designed to use that power for. You know what that is? It says in that text, for the church. The power has been given to him to be exerted, the passage says, for the church. Because it's interesting. Christ's power is going to be supremely showcased, not in flattening Everest, not in creating another galaxy, but in creating this, this vast innumerable assembly, the church, without number. People will blink at the end and say, where did that uncountable multitude come from? That's what he's going to exert his power in. You know, some men dedicate themselves to one great work in life. They're, they're magnum opus that they throw all their life energies and power into. William Wilberforce, what was his great work? He gave himself to the abolition of the African slave trade, and he achieved it. Now, what about a guy like Oscar Schindler? World War II, he was giving himself to rescuing Jews, led to slaughter in Nazi death camps. I'm reading a book, it's, it's called JFK, America's Moonshot. And it spoke about how John F. Kennedy, the president, dedicated himself to making sure America was the country to put the first man on the moon. Those are all great works, magnum opuses, men put their hands to as a focus. But the man Jesus Christ dedicated his chief energies to ensuring that the church would be built. That's what his focus was. It says in Matthew 16, 18, on this rock I will build my, he was a carpenter, wasn't he? I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. See, here is the chief stage that displays Jesus' resurrection power. It's, it's the church of Christ. This is the center stage platform on which all creation will behold the most breathtaking spectacle of Jesus' muscle flexing. It won't be on the moon. It's not the stage of it. It's going to be in the church. The church is the chosen site for Jesus exhibiting the wonders of his glory, the magnificence of his power in assembling this great multitude of hell-deserving sinners who are heaven-dwelling saints who will glorify the one who sits on the throne forever. That is the reward of Christ's resurrection. 
that power to build a church. Come out with me fourthly and finally now. Just consider the proclamation of Christ's resurrection. The proclamation of Christ's resurrection. That's in verses 19 and 20, where it says, because all authority has been given to me, Jesus says, <clears throat> Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You, you see... Do you see how Christ's power is directly related to the display of that power being exerted amidst his church? You know, you read the narrative of the Gospels. We might think that since Christ has now exchanged his humiliation for his exaltation, we might think, well, now it's time for his followers to strap on their swords and take up their battle axes and exert revenge on those who dared to crucify him on the cross. You might think, according to the narrative and the drama, that that's what Jesus might say when he rose from the dead and said, I got all power, now I give it to you. But that's not what he says. He doesn't say, take up your swords and slay my enemies. Instead, he says, I got this power. He turns to us and says, go. Go with this power. And this is our job. These are marching orders from Captain Jesus. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And that's the way that you're going to subdue all things under my feet. It's interesting how that that almighty power is made perfect in, in weakness. Because what's our weapon? It's not an axe. It's not a sword. It's the foolishness of the gospel. That's how we're to accomplish these conversions of this uncountable multitude from every tribe, tongue, kindred, and nation. It's not an atomic blast that immediately brings the multitude. No. Slowly, surely, Jesus Christ is exerting his resurrection power through the weak thing that I'm doing right now, preaching the word. You might be doing to your children at home, teaching them the gospel. What you might say to a man on a Holland street, giving them the word of God. Slowly through preaching, Jesus assembles this great group. So we're looking at the proclamation of Christ's resurrection. Just consider before we go three things. He does it first by weak men and women. By weak men. The 11 disciples who stood by Jesus on that Mount of Ascension, it says in verse 28, those 11 were the first ones who were told, where are they now? Well, they're gone. So what, the commission's all done. It was just for those 11. Oh, no, no, it's for all the disciples of Jesus. That's the handful here. And that's the, that's the, the, the hundreds, the thousands, the hundreds of thousands out there. We are all to be taking the gospel. Us? 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 Well, look at us. Talk about a motley assembly of weakness. I mean, that's our specialty here, isn't it? Weakness. We're all so weak. We're all so frail. We're all so incompetent. And, and for us in Holland here, when, when we look out on the intimidating lake shore from this upper room auditorium here, who do we face? We're going to get them to bend the knee to Jesus and worship him with all their heart and strength and soul? I'm telling you, these people are so disinterested. How are they ever going to be on fire for Christ? Yesterday, I preached at a Good Friday service in Grand Rapids. And I came out on Leonard Street, and there was a guy walking his dog. And I'm full of the gospel. And I, and I said to this man, I said, it's Good Friday. He looked at me, yeah, he's about my age, yeah. I said, you know what Good Friday is? Looked at me, he said, I used to know, but I, I can't remember what it was. Those are the ones that we're supposed to cause 
to be loving the Lord Jesus with all their heart and strength and soul? This is an intimidating task. Those people out there, they're, they're so hypnotized by the pleasures of this world. It seems impossible to divert their attention to focus on the world to come. Even during COVID-19, everybody's binging on Netflix. Don't have time to listen to preaching on the web or going to the Lord's Day service on a typical Sunday when there's football taking place. How are we supposed to even make any gains in this kind of a culture? They're, they're so deceived by unbiblical doctrine. They think man is good. They think the judgment to come is a myth. It seems impossible to pry them away from the false teachings that will damn their souls. And they're so apathetic, disinterested about the condition of their souls. It seems impossible to get them interested in the one thing needful. And then they're exposed to this immorality of this culture. We live in such a wicked and adulterous generation. How in the world are we going to pull them away from the vomit of this immorality? And how are they going to not be like the, the dog that returns to its vomit? How are we supposed to do this? Who, who are we to stand against this horde of intimidating enemy forces? Who are we to snatch souls like burning sticks from the fire? Who are we to, to witness conversions here at Harbor Church and enjoy baptisms and to see Christ add numbers, big numbers to us? So that we can fetch a thousand tongues to sing his praise. This seems like an, a pipe dream. It's impossible for us to accomplish. Who are we to do this? We're disciples. That's who we are. We're disciples who have been empowered by the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Because he said, the you and the you and the me, all power has been given to you. Therefore, go, baptize, and teach power to disciples. In John 20, it says that he came to his disciples as he breathed into them. What did he breathe into them? He breathed the Spirit of God into them. Chronicles of Narnia asked them to be able to breathe on stone statues, and they came alive. The Lord Jesus is more powerful than an, an Aslan. And, and who... Who were the incompetents back then? Eleven men. <laughs> Some of them were uneducated fishermen. But the Lord Jesus used such to subdue the world. Because all the power that was given to them wasn't theirs, and it's not ours. It's the one who sits on the throne. It's given to us. Just, just imagine as they looked out from their upper room in Jerusalem there, when, like on the day of Pentecost. Man, they were huddled up there. Jerusalem was so intimidating with those who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. But when the Spirit came to them, the doors were blown open and they went out with power. And 3,000 were converted in a single sermon. And these 11 guys went out and they turned the world upside down. Those 11. I guarantee you, they didn't recognize themselves. Pentecost and beyond. And just my hope is that the wind of the Spirit would come and blow into you and me and them and those. That the world would be turned upside down. That we would be given inspiration for a sustained effort to go and make disciples by weak men and women. But secondly, consider proclamation to dead sinners. To dead sinners. Now, understand, I am not suggesting that we possess abilities in persuasion and rhetoric and reason so that we can convert someone because we're intelligently capable. Now, we might as well go off to Pilgrim Cemetery and start shouting to those gravestones because nothing's going to happen if it's left to us. But, but like it says in Ephesians 2, it says, but... You, you were dead in trespasses and sins. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. 
by grace you have been saved. People can rise from the dead because of the power that is us. People who are dead in their transgressions and sins. You, you know that passage in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel, go to that valley of dead bones. Dead bones? Prophesy to them. Go ahead, breathe the truth on them. And those dead bones began to rattle. And they stood. And they got sinew and muscle and breath. And they became an army. This is a magnum opus. This is a great work. This is a multitude. And we've been given what weapon? I'm supposed to go out into the lake shore and I'm supposed to speak the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what? It is the power of God for salvation. It can make the dead alive. It's like when Israel saw the intimidating walls of Jericho, God told them to do a foolish thing. Blow trumpets. Oh, come on. Blow the trumpets with your breath. And those walls tumbled down. That's what we can do. You see, you see a fortress of sin against God. You think of Perkins back in the 1500s. There's that murderer about to go up to the gallows. Now there's an unlikely convert, huh? But let's just go back to the account of what happened there in Perkins' life back in the 1500s in Cambridge. That man is going up the gallows. He's a murderer. He's about to swing and hang from a rope. And Perkins petitioned the executioner, the biographer says, asking if the criminal might descend just for a moment that he might prepare for eternity. And, and Perkins knelt behind, beside the poor youth, and tearfully described the dreadful wrath of God that awaited him just beyond the rope. And Perkins drew with the blackest lines the corrupt nature of the man's sins against the holy law of God, whose righteousness condemned him to an eternity of hell and wailing in the lake of fire. To this, the man began to weep aloud with horror. But then Perkins began to explain the saving work of Christ for hell-deserving sinners. The blood of Christ was so liberally applied to the black lines of that man's sins, they were covered over completely by the red smearing of Christ's blood. And when the youth saw it, he began to weep again. But this time there were tears of joy that, that such a Savior was available to such a sinner. And there and then, Perkins and the young man prayed together that the Lord would have mercy on his soul. And then the young man, the biographer says, arose and swiftly ascended the stairs, and from the gallows podium, he addressed for a few moments the onlooking congregation on the mercy he had just received and the mercy they needed to secure for themselves. And then moments later, he was hung to death. And so it seems he went directly to heaven because of the gospel. Now, if ever there was an unlikely convert, it was this hard-hearted soul. But Perkins put his lips to the trumpet and he blew, and the walls of opposition tumbled down. Maybe you're listening to this. Maybe you're in the auditorium here. And you're facing COVID-19. You're walking slowly. You're heavy laden because of your own sin. You know you're on your way to the gallows of judgment. You're listening on the camera, maybe. I don't know where you are. You realize that right now, you can kneel down, seeing the evil of your sin and seeing how the blood of Christ can make the foulest clean. And like that man on his way to the rope, you're on your way to the grave too, just like me. And you can cry out to the Lord Jesus to have mercy on you and you too can be saved, though you and I may swing soon. Even dead sinners can be saved by this gospel. But just lastly, as we look at the proclamation of Christ's resurrection by weak men to dead sinners, now just consider with personal application. The point is, we must all be about the business of speaking to dead bones. That's what Christ called us to do. Why we still have breath. We might use our breath to give the gospel even to hardened sinners. All power is with us. In fact, you know that passage we say, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In the context, it's not for comfort. I'm with you even to the end of the age. You can be comforted. That's true, but it's mainly for power. 
We're to be out there about the business of seeking tongues to sing Christ's praise. And lo, I'm with you. In other words, you will have power. Spurgeon says this. See then, my brethren, in your high calling. If you're enlisted in this army, I charge you to be faithful to your great Captain Jesus, to do his work carefully in the way in which he has prescribed you, and then expect to see his power displayed to his own glory. I preached on this theme, this passage, 20 years ago. And I remember back then, David Woodman. Remember when he used to be a part of our church? Old Dave Woodman was a part of our church. And about 20 years ago, his 93-year-old, the, the great-grandfather patriarch of the family died. And he was telling us back then how after the 93-year-old's funeral, he was a Christian godly man, that the whole family then met around a piano, just like this one. They were all singing hymns. And there were, there were dozens and dundras, maybe a hundred people who were around that, plus around that piano singing. Where'd they all come from? Where, where'd this... Where'd this multitude of people come from? I'll tell you where it came from, Dave Woodman says. That back in the early 1900s, there was a woman who was hanging wash in the neighborhood. And she was an unbeliever. And from across the hedge, a woman shouted and told her about Jesus. And told her the gospel over the hedge. And that woman who was old great-grandma Woodman, she went to a church and she was taught the gospel, and she was baptized, and old grandfather Woodman got converted, and then the children got converted, and the children's children got converted, and the children's children children got converted. And there they were around the piano, this, this, this multitude singing praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you? You're a woman in your neighborhood, and so are you too. You, there, there's power that you have and that breath that you have to speak and to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a great sermon that Spurgeon has on this passage. He says, I'd close my sermon very practically. Spurgeon says, we are receivers that we might be distributors. Dear brother and sister, to how many have you told the story of redemption by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? I ask you, what are you personally doing? Perkins always was a lover of condemned prisoners. Listen to us. We were all condemned prisoners. And we've been set free. How is it that we don't have a heart for those who are walking heavy laden to the gallows of their own death? We have something to say. We can't be silent. We have the remedy. So let's take our lips. Just put it to the trumpet of that simple gospel. They'll call us stupid. They'll call us foolish. By the foolishness of the gospel a multitude will be saved because that's what Captain Jesus told us to do. Praise his holy name because he's risen. He's risen indeed. Can we sing one more hymn before we go home this morning to the praise of the Lord Jesus?